Good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's an honor to worship the Lord with you today and also to study His Word with you. And uh, it's, it's a great day. I love these mornings where it's kind of chilly but also really sunny. Uh, definitely feels like a fall day, doesn't it? Uh, won't feel like that for long. Winter will set in. But praise God. We have, if we can get on the screen, we have a QR code. If we get that on the screen, you, technology is amazing, right? You can take out your phone and scan that from where you're sitting if you want to get connected here at FBC. Uh, this will take you to a form. You can fill it out on your phone and get you in the system. Um, we, if, if you have a prayer request you'd like to submit, you can do that through the website. If you want to get on the prayer list, you can do that through this system as well. Uh, you can stay in the know with anything that's going on here, so please check that out. Please follow it. Like I said, technology is amazing. You ain't even got to get out of your seat. That's really cool. We have voter guides in the back of the church. Today is the last day of early voting here in New York State. So if you haven't grabbed a voter guide, you want to be more informed, uh, there's some very serious stuff on the ballot this year uh, with some very serious implications for religious liberty Help yourself. We can't tell you how to vote, nor are we interested in telling you how to vote, but we just want you to vote from an informed perspective, and we want to vote as people who fear the Lord. So check that out, and uh, make sure you know, you're up to date on everything that's going on. Tonight is our youth group. That's from 6 to 7.30 in the fellowship hall. This is for all the middle schoolers and high schoolers. Always a fantastic time. Immediately following the worship service today, if you're on the camp committee, you got a group text this morning, we'll be having uh, a very quick huddle, um, and I think just to decide one, one point of business. So that's right after the worship service. You want to meet up front with that, Martin? Over there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Also today, after the worship service, is the luncheon for the young adults. It's not just for college students, but for young adults. Uh, so stick around, have a meal, have a time of fellowship, uh, this is the second month we've offered this. It's been great. That's in the fellowship hall right after the service today. As you all know, we've been taking a love offering for the church in Fletcher, North Carolina that got hit by the hurricane. We will do that today and next Sunday and wrap it up next Sunday. So if you would like to contribute to that, you guys have been very, very generous. If you'd like to contribute to that, please get your donation into the offering plate today. Uh, or next Sunday, 100% of what you give towards that goes to this church that is helping to rebuild and helping the families in the community. Like I said, you guys have done an, a fantastic job and shown some incredible love and generosity. We want to do everything we can to help them out. If we were in their shoes, we would want other churches to come alongside us, right? So let's do it. Um, in two weeks, two weeks from today, we will be taking up a love offering for Dick Matthews, our missionary to Cambodia and Taiwan. We got a letter from him this week this man is 93 years old. He's going back to Cambodia and Taiwan, I think, at the end of this year. We've partnered with him before. We want to partner with him again. So that will start in two weeks, and that will run for about a month. If you want to make a donation to partner with him, just like this love offering, everything you give will go directly to Dick Matthews to continue his work. He's going over there to help with church plants. He's going over there to preach, to encourage people, to kind of serve uh, as an elder saint to these churches that are getting off the ground in Cambodia and Thailand. Like I said, he is 93 years old. That is just incredible. Prime Timers, our ministry to senior citizens, is meeting Friday, November 8th uh, here at FBC, 9.45 a.m. Y'all will be going to Cuba Cheese Shop and an Amish store. Sounds really delightful. That's Friday the 8th at 9.45 the soup supper that was initially going to take place this week will take place on Wednesday the 13th from 5.30 to 7. That's Wednesday, November 13th, 5.30 to 7. And finally, this is my last one, we're doing Operation Christmas Child again this year. I have two requests. If you want to complete a shoebox, grab a shoebox from the back and grab a label and you can follow the instructions on it. And they've got to be, I hate to give you such short notice, but they've got to be back in two weeks on the 17th. Also, if you've got a vehicle that's a little bit larger than my Honda Civic and you want to volunteer to take the shoeboxes, they're going to the Oda Sega Retreat Center uh, up in Machias. We could use a volunteer for that. So come and see me or Cassie if you can help out in that way. I think just one vehicle should probably do it. they got to be a larger one, okay? Like, you know, don't roll up in a motorcycle. But um, <laughs> if you can help out, we've got a few weeks to figure this out. Uh, that's it, and we have a video queued up for this as well. 
let the little children come to me. Don't forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. Let the little children come to me. Let the little children come to me. Don't forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Operation Christmas Child is a way for the little children to come to Almighty God. That is the best gift of all, is becoming part of God's family. The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus, children are being discipled, and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. These children are brave and bold, not afraid, and they're not ashamed of the gospel. They're trained and equipped to go out and share their faith with others. And many times in areas where it's an unreached people group, the Bible tells us the time is now. Let them come, Jesus said, let them come. And they're coming. They're coming by the millions. Every single box represents the life of a young boy, a young girl, who will be touched by the gospel. Jesus has come to give them light, that they do not need to be in the darkness, that they have hope, that they have joy. And it is our prayer that this glorious light of the gospel will flow among the nations and will fill our land with the knowledge of the glory of God. The Lord God Almighty desires to fulfill His redemptive plan for mankind in and through each of us and all of us. All of us are children of God. We share this incredible opportunity to take the gospel truly to the ends of the earth by gathering children to Jesus. I believe this year for Operation Christmas Child, this may be the most important year, most important opportunity that we'll ever have to reach children in the name of Jesus Christ. Pray that God will use these shoebox gifts to make a difference in the children's life for eternity. this morning is Isaiah. From time to time I use some of these over. <laughs> it's all God's word. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I'm greatly encouraged by the numbers that keep increasing, that we can share the love of God together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your blessing on us this morning. For the fact that your mercies are new every day. Your forgiveness is always available to us when we go astray. Thank you for calling us together here this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth together. Lord, we lift up our nation to you this morning, our leaders, that your truth soak into them and guide them in the right way. 
I pray this morning for discernment for your people across our land. That they will search out truth and that they will show up and vote informed and standing for your truth. I pray, Lord, your safety, your, your protection, your care for each and every one that's running for office and that your truth soak into them as well. And we trust the outcome on Tuesday into your hands, for we know you see the big picture. And now we ask your blessing on us as we worship you, as we share together in song, in spiritual songs and psalms and hymns. Bless our hearts and, and lift us up into your presence. Bless Mark as he brings the message. And we commit all these things into your name. Amen. Greet one another.
Ja. No, you guys are just. Okay. I forgot. Okay. So. Okay. told you anything that you've not known? Who has taken something from you that you hold? Who has thought one thing in all the earth you didn't know? Who has taught the sun just when to rise to bring the morning light? When to fall beneath us all the dark of night. There is none like you. Let your praises ring. There is one to whom all creation sings. We love you and our song will pour in me. Long live me. Who has taken one 
one breath that you didn't give. Who has numbered all the days that all will live? Who has given you counsel on the matter?
Father, thank you for that promise that through Jesus we can be your child, your son, your daughter. Thank you for calling us all to this place today to worship together in your name and spirit and truth. Ask now for clarity of mind and speech for Mark. Please help him to speak out boldly the message you've given him and us to receive it well. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Open your Bibles, please, to Psalm 131, if you would. My sermon this morning is entitled, A Short Song with a Strong Message. We are coming to the end of our time in the Psalms of Ascent here. Now, Psalm 131, as we're looking at today, it is the shortest psalm yet. Uh, it's just three verses but I think you'll find that those three verses pack quite a punch, and as always, God does not need to say much uh, to hit us deeply. And I've been wrestling with these three verses all week now and been very convicted by it. But let's look into God's word together here. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Let me read that again. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Father, we come to, come to you today knowing that we are your children, not because of anything that we've done, but because of your grace, your love, and your mercy poured out on us. We praise you for that wondrous truth, and we ask that you would equip us to live our lives as a reflection of that. Help us to surrender to you, to pursue you, devote ourselves to you even more, never to be satisfied with our love for you, but to seek to love you more and to seek to love one another more. Convict us, Lord, where we need to be convicted. Instruct us where we need instruction and encourage us where we need encourage, encouragement. And you know all these things because of your perfect wisdom. Please be with us now, we humbly ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Charles Spurgeon was commenting on this psalm, Psalm 131, and he said, this is one of the shortest psalms to read, but one of the longest to learn. One of the shortest psalms to read, but one of the longest to learn. And it's true. It's sometimes the simplest truths that we have the most difficulty putting into practice, right? We've actually traveled. It's really incredible. Like I said, we're coming to the end of the Psalms of Ascent. We've actually traveled quite a big distance from Psalm 129 two weeks ago to Psalm 131 today. In Psalm 129, the author was going before the Lord. It was an imprecatory psalm. And he was begging God, Lord, take vengeance on my enemies. Like, Take them off of their game, stop them in their tracks, confuse them, go after my enemies, I'm suffering because of these people. That was Psalm 129. In Psalm 130, the author was crying out to the Lord for forgiveness for his own sins. And now in Psalm 131, we see that the, the psalmist is, is content and he's humble before the Lord and that he's made it his life's mission to pursue humility, to pursue having a humble heart, it's almost like a 180 degree difference from two weeks ago to today. Now, Psalm 131 is a psalm of triumph. It's actually a psalm of victory. But you'll see that victory from God's perspective looks different from victory to the world's perspective, right? There's nothing in this psalm about fame or wealth or power. Victory looks like I've quieted my soul before God and I'm not being prideful, I'm not prideful in my heart, I'm not prideful in my eyes, I'm not prideful in my thinking. That's what victory looks like from God's perspective. So different from what we see the world telling us, right? You just got to jump on social media for 10 or 15 seconds a day and you'll see a video of, of someone, this is how you get wealthy, this is how you do this, this is how you, how you pursue these pleasures. God says victory is a humble heart and a contented life. And we see this here, right? This is a psalm of David. 
David was the author of this one, along with Psalm 122 and 124 that we've seen, and Psalm 133 that we'll see, Lord willing, in a few weeks. Now, not only is this a worship song, but this psalm is also a prayer. This is a prayer. How do we know that? He starts off with, O oh Lord. He is speaking directly to God. We'll see that more in a moment. I think a good parallel passage to this psalm is Zephaniah 3, verse 17, which reads like this. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. We'll see two big things in these three verses. First, we will see how to develop and practice humility, and then we will see how to become content. Here's the first thing, practicing humility. One of the overarching lessons of this psalm, one of the overarching lessons of Scripture is that those who practice humility, those who are humble, are the only ones who find contentment. They're the only ones who find rest. Your ticket to a contented life, your ticket to a contented heart, is found in not thinking too highly of yourself. Your ticket to a contented heart is seeing yourself the way that you should see yourself. Another quote from Charles Spurgeon is that humility is a correct assessment of yourself. Humility is a correct assessment of yourself. Why do I say this? What does pride tell you? Pride tells you that it's never enough. You want more. You feel entitled to more. The things in your life that you have, if you're prideful, you don't see them as blessings. You see them as wages. You see them as things that you deserved. Pridefulness teaches you that there is never enough. You see yourself as deserving of more than what God has given you. It is impossible to honor God and hold on to an arrogant heart. Why do I say that? If you come to the Lord because you want to be saved, the very first thing that you have to do is humble yourself. You have to admit, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I cannot save myself. I cannot clean myself up before God. I need Jesus. I need your son. I need the one you sent. I need his sacrifice to pay my penalty. You're humbling yourself before God. After you're saved, if you want to live a life that pleases God, if you want to walk with God, you have to walk with him humbly, right? Walk humbly with your God. We find that in Scripture. Scripture also says, uh, you know, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and in the right time or the due time, he will exalt you. Humble yourself. This isn't really deep doctrine necessarily, but it's something that's foundational to the Christian life. With that in mind, join me in verse 1, please. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. Now, I think in just this one verse, we see three different ways that God would have us develop humility. Now, it's ironic. You read this. David wrote it. You're like, this doesn't actually sound very humble to say, right? He almost seems to us like he's bragging about his humility. A lot of people think that if you talk about being humble, now you're not humble anymore. But it really depends on your heart. It depends on why you're saying what you're saying, and it depends on who you're saying it to, to see if you're still humble. Like I said, this is a prayer. He's not going to us. He's not standing up in an assembly and saying, I'm so humble. He's talking directly to the Lord. He's not bragging about his humility. He's confessing his humility to the one who has given him everything. And that's humble. By the way, uh, there's, I don't know if you ever read Numbers 12, verse 3, it says, there was a man, Moses, who was very humble, and it says, and Moses was more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Do you know who wrote that? Moses did. <laughs> <laughs> Moses is out there like, yeah, that's me. I'm more humble than anyone else. That's me. Uh, I'm not kidding you, bro. But here's the first way that we can practice humility. Here's the first way. Do not be proud in your own heart. Here's, do not be proud in your own heart. This is how David begins his prayer. He says, O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. That's the first part. My heart is not lifted up. It is appropriate that the prayer starts this way, right? My, another way of saying this would be, my heart is not proud within me, or uh, I don't have pride in my heart. My heart is not puffed up towards you. Humility, <laughs> humility has to begin in your heart, or it does not begin anywhere. If you have a prideful heart, you're just prideful, Okay? It doesn't matter if your actions seem humble. It doesn't matter if your words seem humble. You may have convinced other people that you're humble. Maybe you even convinced yourself you're humble. But if you are prideful in your heart, then you're just prideful. And guess what? The one who can read hearts, the one who knows all things, the one who can discern all things, he knows what's going on. 
And a prideful heart is a sin and an offense against the Lord. Now that's the root of our pride issues. You fix your heart with God's help, you fix yourself with God's help. Then what do I mean by that? Take your prideful heart to the Lord. Repent of it. Ask him to change it. Ask him to transform you and see what he does. Humble yourself before him. See how he changes you. And your whole life will change as a result of that. But if you're trying to clean up your words or if you're trying to clean up your actions and your heart is still harboring pride, none of those things will actually change. We see this total out. Look at Proverbs 16, verses 5 and 6 with me, please. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. And be assured, he will not go unpunished. Verse 6. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for, and by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. I want us to focus on that statement there in verse 5. Everyone who is arrogant at heart is an abomination to the Lord. What does it look like when someone is arrogant in heart, or what does it look like when someone is puffed up inside themselves? A lot of times, it involves entertaining thoughts that you really shouldn't be entertaining, like, Man, I've, I've really got it going on. You know, thinking to yourself, man, I'm, I'm a cool guy. The people in my life, they're lucky to have me, right? Uh, I've got it all figured out. If there's some conflict or disagreement, it can't be my fault because I know everything. Or I'm just so gifted. Or I'm so talented. It's entertaining thoughts like that. It can also take the form of not seeing the things that you're blessed with as blessings. Like we said, feeling that you're entitled to them, not being grateful for them. If God has blessed you with something, see how you can take it and multiply it for his kingdom and for his glory. And pride gets in the way of those kinds of things. Now, what are we told? We're told to rebuke ourselves when we start thinking that way. Lots of people, when they have a thought, they end up just giving into that thought. They end up caving to it. Scripture says, take your thoughts captive before Christ. Hand them over to him. Be intentional with the things that you allow yourself to think. Still in Proverbs, turn over to chapter 18, verse 12 here. Before destruction, a man's heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. Before destruction, a man's heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor, right? Before you are destroyed, before your life really comes crashing down, before you really feel the weight of everything that you've done, your heart is haughty. Before you fall down, you're prideful. But if you're going to be honored, you first have to be humble. You know, during his earthly ministry, our Lord Jesus talked about this a lot, uh, made, made a lot of teachings about this, probably because uh, his main spiritual opponents were people who were very arrogant. They were arrogant in their hearts, they were arrogant in their actions, they thought they knew everything, okay? And they thought they were in a position to order people's eyes for them. And so naturally, they bump into Jesus a lot, who's teaching the opposite of those things. But in Luke 14, this is really cool. In Luke 14, Jesus actually gets invited to have dinner at a Pharisee's house. And he's having dinner with this Pharisee, and there are other Pharisees there. It's like in the lion's den, okay? This was probably a very tense meeting, you can imagine. Look at what Jesus teaches them here, verses 7 through 11 in Luke 14. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor. Lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes to you, he may say, friend, move up higher. There you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You cannot really stay prideful forever because God is eventually going to humble you. And that can be painful. And that can be very unpleasant. But God is not going to let you be puffed up forever. Here's the second thing. Do not be proud in your attitude toward others. Do not be proud in your attitude toward others. Don't be proud in your own heart. And don't be proud in the way that you view other people. This is also foundational. What does this mean? Right? Don't look down on people. Don't think that you're better than they are. Don't put them down. Don't belittle them. Don't berate them. Treat people the way that you want to be treated. This is the second part of his prayer. He says, my eyes are not raised too high. My eyes are not raised too high. Now, is it bad to lift your eyes? Scripture talks about lifting your eyes quite a bit. Uh, and it's often put forth as a good thing. For example, we saw this ourselves back in Psalm 121 just a few weeks ago. And where, where it says to lift our eyes to God, right? The psalmist says, I lift my eyes to the hills. 
Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. This is a good thing. But it, there's a wrong lifting of your eyes where you lift your eyes to look down on other people or you lift your eyes to put yourself above them. This is what we're told not to do. And we know when we're doing it. You absolutely know when you're doing it. Even if it's not expressed, you know when you're looking down on someone. I know when I'm doing it. We all know when we're doing it. We'd have to be ignoring some very serious conviction to not know what's going on there, right? When we fall into this attitude, two things happen. We dishonor the Lord because he's told us not to do that, and we dishonor other people because we make them feel poorly when they didn't have a reason to feel poorly. And this is what David is praying against here. You can either look up to the Lord or you can look down on other people. You can't do both. You can either humble yourself before God or you can think you're better than those around you, but you can't do both. Why do I say that? The attitude that you bring to your relationship with God is the same attitude that you're going to bring to your relationship with your neighbor. It inevitably is. You have to be, you have to be humble all the way through. And it's especially wrong for a Christian to be proud in our attitude towards others. Why is that? Because a Christian is someone who, above all else, acknowledges their own sinfulness, right? A Christian is someone who has to freely acknowledge their own depravity. They have to admit their helplessness before God. They have to admit their helplessness uh, to, to do anything that pleases God apart from him. They confess their need to Jesus for save them. By bearing the name of Christ, we're proclaiming to the world, I am just a sinful wretch who has been saved by the grace of God. If you're saying that out of one side of your mouth, but out of the other side of your mouth you're saying, yeah, but I'm doing better than that guy, that doesn't make any sense. Like, we're not better than anyone else. We need forgiveness as much as anyone that we've ever crossed paths with. There's no justification for looking down on anybody. Now, unfortunately, I think many churches do not have this commitment, right? Many churches actively refuse to welcome. They refuse to associate with anyone who doesn't look like them or anyone who has a different background than them. Uh, they, they will keep people out of the fellowship for reasons that aren't biblical, of course, if you do that long enough, you don't have a church. What do you have? You have a country club. That's unsustainable. That's not God's vision for the church. And so pride becomes the downfall of many churches. And a lot of times, I don't think they realize it until it's too late. But pride becomes the downfall. Uh, and this is why so much of the New Testament uh, is clear that this mentality has no place in the life of the Christian. And, and again, we see this in Jesus' ministry too, right? Jesus was the quickest to associate with those that society had rejected. Uh, tax collectors, sinners, people afflicted with demons, people afflicted with physical ailment, uh, ail illness, excuse me, ailments. The people who were outcasts, these are the ones who Jesus oftentimes went out of his way for. But then you see in Romans 12, verses 16 through 18, we see the same instruction. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all, right? Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Don't think yourself as better than other people. If you want to practice humility, you have to kind of get rid of that. You have to get rid of that when you see it in yourself. You have to get rid of it when you sense it going on in your heart. And when you make this commitment, it'll show through in your behavior. When you, when you actively try not to look down on other people, you will love them more, you will treat them more honorably, you will treat them the way that God wants you to treat them, you'll see them the way that Jesus sees them. And this is something we always have to bring ourselves back to, seeing people the way that Jesus sees them. Not seeing them through our own sinful eyes or, or our own fleshly motivations or anything that gets in the way of that. See them the way that God sees them. We see this in Philippians 2, verses 3 through 7 as well. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Here's the final way you develop humility. Do not feel that you need to know or understand everything. Do not feel that you need to know or understand everything. Do not be proud in your heart. Do not be proud towards others. Do not feel that you need to know or understand everything. What I think this means is be humble in understanding what you know. Be humble in understanding what you don't know. And basically, know your limits. And don't wait. 
the temptation is really strong, but don't wait until you know more to pursue a closer relationship with God. There are too many Christians who feel like, I don't know enough to be of service to God. I don't know enough for God to put me to use in his kingdom. The fact of the matter is, God can use you wherever you are on your spiritual journey if you have a heart to be used. There are people with PhDs in theology who are being used by God mightily. There are people uh, who don't have a formal education who are being used by God mightily. There are people who came to Christ five minutes ago who are already serving him. There are people who have been saved for 50 years who are serving him. What's the common thing that they all have consistently across the board? They want to be used by God. They're not waiting until they know more. They're starting where they are. And as you seek him, and as you study his word, you will know more and more and more, but don't feel that you have to know everything. Start where you are. Still in verse 1, I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. I do not occupy myself with things too great or too marvelous for me. So now David is talking about the intellect, he was talking about the heart, talking about the eyes, and he's talking about the mind. But the word, the Hebrew word that he uses for occupy myself there is actually the Hebrew word for walk. Walk, right? You wouldn't think so, but actually some places it's used for physical walking, like you walk from here to there. Uh, But it's also used in the Bible uh, for how you conduct yourself or how you behave, right? Watch how you walk, that kind of thing. For example, uh, Psalm 1 says, don't walk in the way of sinners. Same word used. And basically here he's saying, I don't walk into things that are too great for me to understand. I leave those things to God. I don't walk into things, there there are things that are too marvelous, I leave those things to God. Now this is humbling to admit, because our flesh says the opposite. Our flesh says we're smart enough, we're wise enough, we're capable enough that we can really understand and we can put into practice anything that we want to. It's humbling to admit that there are some things that you just cannot understand. They're miraculous, or they're supernatural, and we are not omniscient. God is omniscient, we're not. God is infinite, We are not. God is unlimited, but we're very limited. For example, one thing that I cannot wrap my mind around is how can a perfectly holy, perfectly righteous God give salvation to sinners, welcome them into his kingdom, give them fellowship, okay, forgive them, and not compromise his own holiness in the process at all? Like, how can he associate with us but not be tarnished by us? I have faith, I know he does it, but I don't know how. Another thing I really can't wrap my mind around is the nature of eternity. How can something truly never come to an end? Or how can God truly have no beginning and no end? I cannot wrap my mind around. I started thinking about these things when I was like four years old, and I know as much now about them as I did back then. Because if I start thinking about eternity for too long, I get a headache. It's something that I just don't understand. It's too great. It's too marvelous for me. Another thing that we struggle with is that there are limits to the human language. Wouldn't you say so? We have boundaries of human language that we cannot seem to cross. And you see this in Scripture. A writer will be trying to describe God or describe something God does, and they run out of words to do it. Like, they run out of language that they could use. They, like, there's no language that adequately expresses what I'm trying to describe to you right now. They run out of language to do it. They don't have the words to describe what they're trying to describe to you. And so you see phrases like things too great, things too marvelous, all over the place in the Bible. You especially see them in the book of Psalms. I'll give you an example. Psalm 139, verses 4 through 6, with these exact same language, right? Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Even Job, who was known as one of the more humble men in the Bible, even Job gets humbled. Uh, he, God confronts him at the end of his trial, and Job himself gets humbled. Job 42, verses 2 and 3, he admits this. This is Job talking to the Lord. I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know, right? We have to admit we don't know something. Don't be prideful in your heart. Don't be prideful towards others. Don't be prideful in your intellect. Here's another truth. Be content with who God has made you to be. Be happy with who God has made you to be. Be content with the gifts that he's given you. Don't look at other Christians and what they have and don't want what they have. 
be envious in your heart if someone seems more gifted or they seem differently gifted than you. God has a purpose for them. God has a purpose for you. And he gave you your gifts for a reason. Don't try to go after the things that he's given to other people. Um, you know, a bunch of us were at camp this week, and I wasn't there as much as others, but I tried to be there as much as I could. But we're working on these concrete forms, okay, and we got two of them poured. We're getting two of them poured next week. We're working on concrete forms. I was up there for just a few minutes before I learned that I will probably, definitely, definitely never be as handy as some guys in this church, okay? <laughs> It's too wonderful for me. I will never be as handy as Russ. I'll never be as handy as Martin. I'll never be as handy as Carrie. Uh, I watched Randy last week driving the tractor around, and I realized I will probably never operate machinery as well as Randy does. <laughs> I'm okay with that. No one can have it all. Um, I'm totally fine with that. that. That stuff is too great for me, too marvelous for me. I'll just shovel the gravel where you tell me to shovel it or rake it where you tell me to rake it, okay? I'm never going to be the one running those things. I'm fine with it. So much of our life is doing daily tasks, doing everyday tasks to the glory of God and for the love of others. And uh, sometimes we're not satisfied with that. You know, sometimes we want more, we want more, we want more, but that should be enough for us. Here's the next thing we see as we bring the psalm to a close. Develop a contented spirit. We've seen how to become humble. Develop a contented spirit. The next part of this psalm, I think, tells us what happens when we practice humility. We learn contentment. As we saw earlier in the sermon, it's really impossible for a prideful person to be a contented person. I don't think there's ever been a prideful person who did not want more, more, and more. I don't think there's ever been a prideful person who's like, I'm content. I think you have to learn humility in order to be content because if you have an inflated sense of self, you're not going to be grateful for what you have going on in life. I think that uh, this psalm makes that clear. I think that scripture makes this clear, but if you have a correct view of yourself, much of these things will fall into place on their own. Uh, now, what is contentment from a biblical perspective? I think that contentment is just being satisfied with things as they are. Being satisfied with things as they are. I think that's biblical contentment. Being satisfied with what you have, being satisfied with your circumstances because you know that God will never abandon you. If you're content, you're not overly attached to the things of the world. Uh, if you're content, you're not really a super anxious person. I think anxiety and worry are the opposite of contentment, right? If you're content, you're not real envious. You're not real covetous. Those things are the opposite of contentment. You see this developed all over God's word. Philippians 4, verses 11 and 12 gives a perfect example of this. The Apostle Paul states this, is, this was his commitment in life. Now, I'm not speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. And he says what this looks like. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In every, in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Right? I know, what, I know how to be happy in these situations. I know how to have a lot, I know how to have a little. Okay? I'm content. I'm happy with things the way that they are. I trust God. Now, contentment is not something that happens overnight. You don't wake up one day and it's like, ah, I'm content. I've mastered it. It's an ongoing process. And it has setbacks. But it oftentimes comes through experience and it comes through maturity. With that in mind... Turn as we close here to verses 2 and 3 in Psalm 131. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Two steps here to developing a contented spirit. First is be still before the Lord. Be still before the Lord. David is able to claim in this prayer, he's able to confess to God that he has stilled and quieted his soul. And this is no small thing. Now, David had seen his, more than his share of trials and tribulations. He was no stranger to his life being in peril. He had tons of enemies. They were very powerful. There, there were several occasions before he became king when he nearly lost his life. Uh, there were people who threatened to th take his throne while he was king. There were hostile nations like the Philistines that kept on coming after the nation of Israel while he was king. Uh, he experienced and he, and he survived things that most of us can only imagine. I know we often think of stuff like David and Goliath as children's story or stuff that's appropriate for children's church, but he's been, he was actually walked through some like incredibly terrifying and dangerous things. And yet here he is going before the Lord and he can say, I have calmed and quieted my soul. You know how much it takes sometimes for my soul to be uh, anxious? It takes sometimes very little. Um, like, sometimes it's one thing not going my way. I'm like, ah, I'm not really calm right now. 
much less am I going up against a giant or you know, a, a pagan army or something like that. He's saying, I've calmed and quieted my soul. Now, the word calm here means to make something still, you know, level, smooth, like the concrete forms yesterday, nice and level, okay? Or at least they were by the time we left. <laughs> or they will be by the time they pour. Nice and level. You think of like a storm, right? A, a sea and a storm, and you've got waves chopping and going everywhere. That's the opposite of what's going on here. Imagine like a, a lake that's nice and placid, and you can kind of, you can see the reflection of the trees in it. That's the stillness that he's talking about. This is what your heart is like when you're before the Lord, when you've calmed yourself before God. Um, and how did he do this? He's saying he's eliminated these things. He knows these things that agitate his soul. He knows these things that interfere with his relationship with God. And he's eliminated them from his life. He's eliminated a prideful heart. He's eliminated prideful eyes. He's eliminated a prideful mind. And now he, he, he's not thinking that he knows how to run his life. He's trusting God with things he doesn't understand. And this has produced calmness in him. This has quieted his soul. This is the effect of righteousness. Sin does not produce stillness, right? The more that you get tangled in a web of sin and the more that you get tangled up in earthly wisdom and earthly pursuits, the more anxious you become, the more chaotic your life becomes. It does not produce quietness at all. Sin cannot produce quietness or peace or calm. Only righteousness can do that. Have a look at Isaiah 32, verse 17 here. And the effect of righteousness will be peace and the result of righteousness, quietness and trust forever. You cannot say that about anything but righteousness. Sin will never produce peace or quietness. A big part of being still before God is realizing that he's God and we're not God. Realizing that he's sovereign and we're not sovereign. He's in control and, and we're not. We're just on the receiving end of his sovereignty. And when you, when you stop trying to accomplish things that only God can accomplish, you'll be calmer. Now, this doesn't absolve us of the responsibility to serve him or, or to obey him. But there are things that only should be left in God's hands. And when we try to take those things out of God's hands and into our own hands, we become anxious. Psalm 46, verse 10 and 11. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I want you to think about that. Be still and know that I am God. Here's the final thing. Rest your soul in the Lord. This is the last thing developing in contentment here. Rest your soul in the Lord. The imagery that David uses to illustrate this is found in verse 2. He says, like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. He repeats himself. We saw the author do this back uh, in Psalm 130 last week, the same thing, right? He says, we wait for you like watchmen wait for the morning, like watchmen wait for the morning. It's a, it's a poetic device. He's, he's repeating himself to emphasize the truth that we need to understand and we need to put into practice. Uh, what is a child like during the weaning process, right? If you're a parent, you've seen this. They're agitated, uh, they're noisy, they need a lot of attention, they need attention all hours of the day and night. Um, but David in this psalm is saying that he's really come through this process. Like that process is complete in his life. He's done with that. He used to be like that, but now he's like a weaned child. He realizes he doesn't need what he thought he needed before. Uh, this is the picture of peace and contentment. What used to provoke fussing, what used to provoke crying and agitation, no longer affects you. Why? Because you've let go of your pride. You, you've stopped trying to dictate things. You've stopped trying uh, to make everything happen the way you want it to, and you're resting your soul in God. You've experienced true contentment. Now, God doesn't tell us to be childish, uh, but he tells us to be childlike. There's a difference. Childish means you just never matured. Childlike means You've matured, but you never lost the dependence on God that you have. You've never lost the humble uh, reliance on God that characterized you when you were younger. And Jesus goes so far as to say, if you will enter the kingdom at all, you need to enter it like a child. And if you won't enter it like a child, you won't enter it. He asks for constant dependence. He never outgrow that. I want to leave you with an encouragement from Psalm 62, verses 5 and 6 here. For God alone... O oh, my soul, wait in silence. My hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I am still and not shaken. So we need to understand the importance of humility. We need to understand the importance of grasping the things that we become prideful about, rooting those things out of our lives, and handing these things over to the Lord in repentance.
and understand that contentment flows from that, but there are no shortcuts to it. There's no way to find contentment without doing that work of repentance, without giving these things to the Lord. Let's close with prayer. Father God, we love you. We thank you that you've given us the path to a contented life. We thank you that you've made this clear in your word and that you have helped us to accomplish these things and put them into practice through your spirit. We pray, Lord, for greater surrender to you, that you'd help us to turn from any pridefulness in our hearts, in our eyes, in our thinking, to repent of these things because they do not honor you and to find the contentment that you would have for us and that we know is available to us through you. Be with us now, Lord. We pray that you would equip us by the help of your spirit to put into practice what we have learned today and to be better and deeper students of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. We're now going to partake of the Lord's Supper as the Lord Jesus has commanded us to. The only requirement for being a participant of the Lord's Supper is that you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You do not need to hold a church membership you don't need to be a, church, a member of this church. You don't need to be a member of any church. You need to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ who is doing your best to follow him. The scripture says that on the night that our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of the sins of many. Then he made the same statement. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. When we come together to observe the Lord's Supper, we are proclaiming Jesus' death. We are proclaiming his sacrifice that covered our sins, and we're thanking him for it. The Lord's Supper does not have any magical spiritual ability to make you right with the Lord. Only grace through faith can do that. You have to be made right with him in order to rightly observe the Lord's Supper. Later on in 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul is giving similar instructions to the Corinthian church that they had become confused of these things. And he said, let each of you examine yourselves before partaking of the supper. He said, don't partake of it in an unworthy manner, but search your heart. That means confessing any sin that you may be harboring, confessing any bitterness or any hostility towards your fellow believers that you may be holding on to. Give yourself a clean slate with the Lord through his conviction before you observe the Lord's supper. He says, many have failed to do this. And as a result, he says, some have fallen sick some have even died. So the Lord's Supper is meant to be a somber, reverent observation and should not be taken lightly. And Paul reiterates the instructions again that Jesus gave and said, when we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he returns. So we'd like to give you the opportunity to search yourselves this morning as the elements are being distributed. Go to the Lord in prayer. Confess anything that you may be holding on to. Uh, scripture tells us that he's aware of these sins anyway. We're not actually hiding them from him. But when we confess, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that is available to you uh, through the Holy Spirit. So we encourage you to do that.
This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of the sins of many. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. We're going to sing a communion hymn together. If you'd stand and join us as we worship.
benediction is from Romans 16, verses 25 through 27. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith, to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen.